That's the third position! Five round magazine! Low! Junior Leaders Course, Camp Petawawa, Ontario, Canada. We ask soldiers to kill people who they don't even know whenever we decide those people are the enemy. And we ask them to sign a contract with unlimited liability. By becoming soldiers, they agree to die when they're ordered to. To be able to do such extraordinary things, military men need very special beliefs and attitudes. This film is about how soldiers think about themselves and their job, how they have to think in order to survive and function in combat. It makes them a group apart, for it's the nature of combat that shapes the military world and the military mind. Combat is an environment where the normal rules of human conduct do not apply. But soldiers are only ordinary people, and the rules of behavior in combat have evolved to deal with that fact. To operate in this environment, people need a special mental framework and a unique form of organization. There's a separate cast of people in every country who devote their lives to maintaining this organization and nurturing the right attitudes to go with it. They are the professional officers. To understand how they must think, we first have to understand how combat actually works. We'll take our examples from anywhere and any time. In the desert or at sea, 5,000 years ago or now, it's always people who are doing the killing and the dying. Technology has now distanced many military men from the reality of what they do, but they still need to live in a special moral world. I grew up in Vietnam. Uh, all those things I'd taken for granted all my life weren't necessarily there anymore. Uh, the fact that I had friends that were killed who were, were very young, uh, had a very deep impact on me. Uh, death became a real thing. Uh, I am a mortal. Uh, I'm not sure I ever thought about that. I'm not sure very many 19 or 20 year olds think about that. So you've got to keep distant from them. The officer enlisted man distance helps. This is one of the most painful things is having to withhold sometimes your affection for them and your identification with them because you know you're going to have to destroy them on occasion. And you do, you use them up, they're material. And part of being a good officer is knowing how much of them you can use up and get the job done. I would draw one distinction between being a a combat aviator and being uh, someone who is fighting the enemy face to face on the ground. In the air environment, it's very clinical, it's very clean, and it's not so personalized. You, you see an aircraft, you see a target on the ground, you're not eyeball to eyeball with the sweat and the emotions of combat. And so it doesn't become so emotional for you and so personalized. And I think it's easier to do in that sense. You're not so effective. I'm probably the last person you'll ever meet who has used a sword in action on the back of a, a horse. So that was at the beginning of my series, which ended, of course, after uh, the introduction of nuclear weapons. So that spans, really, the whole gamut of the history of warfare, virtually from the Stone Age to the Space Age. But the essential soldier remains same whether he was um, handling a slingshot weapon on Hadrian's wall uh, or whether he's in uh, a main battle tank today uh, he is essentially the same 
the Golan Heights, where Israel and Syria fight their battles. This place is called the Valley of Tears. Right around here in 1973, the Syrians lost 260 tanks. Exact Israeli losses are still secret, but they were losing very heavily too. Now the rule of thumb is that you lose one entire tank crew for every two tanks that are hit. And a tank is not a good place to die. Basically you burn to death unless you're lucky enough to be killed outright by whatever gets through the armor plate at you. And yet both sides kept on with this hellish business all around the clock for almost four days. Nobody quit, nobody ran away. This Syrian crew surrendered only after their tank was burned out. Persuading men to keep going until they are killed or horribly hurt is the key to military success. It always has been. Whether armies won or lost once depended mostly on their discipline and morale. Officers served mainly as a focus of loyalty, and to attract that loyalty they had to cultivate the image of the ideal warrior. But once their troops were committed to battle, officers could have little further influence on the outcome. We can see why in the first battle we know much about, when an Egyptian army met its enemy near Armageddon in 1469 BC. The people of this city, Armageddon, watched the battle that followed from these walls, which were then much higher, of course, to find out whether they would live or die. What they saw on the plain below can best be described as a choreographed riot. The Egyptians advanced shoulder to shoulder in ranks four or five deep with their spears leveled until the shock of contact with the enemy's formation. And then it was pure mob scene. Push and shove and scuffle and stab and try to topple as many of the men facing you as possible until in only a few minutes the other side started to panic. And then it turned into sheer slaughter for the losers. Most of them were cut down from behind by the Egyptians when they turned and tried to flee only to find themselves still trapped in their own crowd. Over 3,000 years later, in the English Civil War of the mid-1600s, battles still work much the same way. Individual soldiers struggle to control their terror, and each side's aim is to break down the other side's control. But new kinds of troops are now starting to appear on the battlefield. Not just the traditional pikemen and cavalry, but musketeers and artillery. And officers have many more decisions to make. The advent of firearms is beginning to force armies to spread out over far greater areas. It's no longer enough for an officer to fight bravely and inspire confidence. He now has to manage the battle. Eventually, armies find it necessary to train professional officers in military academies. Moscow.